We've been spending Advent in the first chapter of Luke. Last week we talked about Zechariah. Now we're going to turn to the 26th verse and talk about Mary. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to God, by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. If you ever hear God say to you, Greetings, favored one, you better kind of tighten your seatbelt. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. There's that theme again. Do not be afraid. You see it throughout the New Testament. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be? We've got that bolded, don't we? How can this be since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy, he will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren because she was old. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Over the last two or three years, I've spent some time trying to kind of surface some major themes that run through the Old Testament, New Testament both, in an effort to help us understand the narrative, and the ongoing narrative of the Bible and to make the reading of the Bible easier and more clear. So, for instance, the theme of spiritual journey is one that we'll see throughout the Bible, beginning with Abraham, Mary and Joseph being asked to go on a journey. That's one of the themes. There are a number of them. Today I want to point this one out. In many ways, the story of the Bible is the story of God coming to the most unlikely people in the world and making them pregnant. It starts early on in the first few chapters of Genesis. You turn to chapter 12 in Genesis. That's the beginning of the story of Abraham and Sarah. Originally they're called Abram and Sarai. And God comes to Abraham and Sarah and he says, look, I've got an important uh, uh, thing that I want you to do. I have a journey I want you to take. And this is my promise to you, that if you will be faithful to me, I will make you the patriarch and, ma and matriarch of a great nation. And they say to God, how can this be since Sarah is old and barren? And God says, trust me. And God gives to Abraham and Sarah in their old age a son who will become the father of a great nation. And that theme is found and repeated over and over again in the Old Testament. You don't have to read very far before you read the story of Rebekah, and then the story of Rachel, and then the story of Hannah, and then the story of, she's unnamed, the unnamed wife of Manoah. The story about God coming to old, older women who cannot conceive and making them pregnant. And then we find it right here in the very first part of the New Testament, Luke. You can take Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It doesn't make any difference which one you read first. They're, they all are really the beginning of the New Testament. And right here in the first chapter, God comes to Elizabeth, the wife of Zechariah, who is old and barren. And he makes her pregnant. You might say that God specializes in geriatric pregnancies. <laughs> I'm glad they laugh because I know I'm a little bit on the edge there, but you know, after this many years, y'all have dealt with it before. Yeah, you might say that God specializes in geriatric pregnancies, but we know, of course, that this theme is both literal and symbolic because what we, what we really know is that throughout the Old and New Testaments, 
God comes to the most unlikely of people and makes them pregnant with the possibilities of the God-given life. Pregnant with the powerful possibilities of what it means to follow God. And so it wasn't just Sarah and Rachel and, and the others. It was God coming to Jacob, a, a liar and a thief of all things, and, and making him pregnant with the possibilities of what he could do by being faithful to God. It was God coming to Moses out there in the middle of the pasture, doing nothing and saying, Moses, I've got a job for you. I'm going to make you pregnant with the possibilities of the faithful life. And Moses goes and releases the Hebrew people and takes them to the promised land. It's the story of God going to a young boy out in the pasture keeping sheep by the name of David and said, David, I see you as the king of a great nation. You are nobody now, but I will make you pregnant with the possibilities of a God-given and faithful life. And then in the New Testament, you see with Joseph and Mary and Peter and Paul and all the others. Here in Luke, God departs from this pattern of going to older, barren women. And he comes to a young teenager, maybe 13 or 14 years old, by the name of Mary. But this will be the greatest pregnancy of all. God says to Mary, Mary, you will become pregnant. And you will not only become pregnant, but you will be pregnant and you will give birth to the Son of God. To the Son of God. And Mary utters these memorable words. How can that be? How can that be? What do you suppose she meant when she said those four words? How can that be? Over 30 years ago, I was the very young pastor in a, a church north of here. I'd only been there a few months. Things were going pretty well. I was sitting in my office one day in the month of October. I'd come in June, made it to October. They hadn't kicked me out yet. And the phone rang. It was the police. They said, Reverend Underwood, we have something we need you to do for us. They said the name of a very prominent family in town, members of my church. And they said, we have received word that their daughter and son-in-law have been found dead in their home in West Texas. I, I knew who they were. They had been married just a couple of months before I had arrived in this city. And even though I came in June, they'd been married in April, I heard all the wonderful stories about this young couple. The wedding, the celebration, everybody in town knew them. How much everybody thought of this young man who had married this woman, a young woman who had grown up in this town and everybody knew and loved. I asked the officer to repeat again just to make sure. She said they'd been found dead in their home in West Texas. We need you to go over to Dub's office and tell him. I don't care whether you are a young pastor or an old pastor as I am these days. There's no good way to do this. There's no science to it. You just put one foot in front of the other. I was escorted into his office. He stood up. He was thrilled. I hadn't been to his office. He was thrilled to see me. He was in a great mood, joyful. God, how great it is for you to come visit me. He had me sit down, offered me a cigar. I thought there's no point in delaying this. I looked him in the eyes. I said, Dub, your daughter and son-in-law have been found dead in their home in West Texas. Now, I will never forget this. His expression did not change. He was just frozen in time. His face, no words came out of his mouth, no movement in his face. One little movement, his jaw dropped just almost imperceptibly. And we sat there in silence for, I guess, a full minute. I wasn't sure whether he had heard me or whether the words had come in one ear and out the other ear. And in shock, he, he didn't remember what it was that I'd said. So after a minute, I repeated the words. I said, Dub, your daughter and her 
new husband have been found dead in their home in West Texas. And he said these four words. How can this be? A few days later, I went to Wichita Falls to visit the hospitals. I went up on the third floor of Wichita Falls General the, and walked into the room of a young woman, a member of my church who had given birth to a little, du- a little girl, a daughter. And I walked in this room and there was flowers and she was feeling great. She was sitting up in bed. She had put on her makeup and she was holding this little girl. I was the only one there in that moment. And as soon as I came in, she looked up and she smiled and she greeted me. And she held up this little girl in a blanket and she said, look at this, look at this. How can this be overcome with such joy? I remember the first time I stood on the top of Mount Walk out in Fort Davis, Texas, about 7,000 feet at McDonald's Observatory. It was August, but it was cold in Fort Davis and it was cold on Mount Locke I literally had on a heavy jacket and the sun went down and the canopy of stars appeared and I looked up there I saw more stars than I'd ever seen in my life more stars than I had ever conceived of or dreamed of I looked up there I was just literally overwhelmed by the beauty and the grandeur of it and I found these words falling out of my mouth how can this be What do you suppose Mary meant by those words when she said, how can this be? Were they words that came from a woman who was literally terrified to the point of tears? Were they the words of a woman who was overcome with joy? Or were they the words of a young woman who in that moment was simply bewildered, overwhelmed by the power and the mystery of God? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know about you how you would answer it, but my guess is it was a little bit of all three. In this moment, she was afraid and sad and full of joy and utterly bewildered. Angel Gabriel had come to her and said, I'm going to make you pregnant with the possibilities of a God-given life and a God-given child. I think the most difficult thing that you and I face day in and day out, week in and week out, year in and year out, is trying to figure out the meaning of what it is that is going on in our lives. I don't know whether you agree with me about this or not, but I think most of you probably do. You know, there is that saying, God will never give us more than we can handle. I I really, I'm not sure whether that's true or not, but I do believe it would be true if at least we could understand the meaning of what's going on in our lives. Because that can be really, really challenging. I think most of us, if things are going really, really well, there are two tendencies. If things are going really, really well, we kind of celebrate the moment and we don't think much about God because we think, yeah, we deserve it, right? We've done a good job, had a good year. Thank goodness things are coming together. We don't think about God at all. But if we do think about God in those bountiful and joyful moments, I think most of us just kind of feel like falling to our knees and saying, thank you, God. We understand that it's not just us, it's God that is blessing us. God that is blessing us. And the problem is that when the next week comes or the next month or the next year and suddenly we find ourselves in one of those really, really dark places, we have difficulty understanding what it is that's taking place in our lives. What is the meaning of it? How can this be? We wonder, does this mean that God is somehow cursing us after blessing us or is this just the absence of of God good luck bad luck no luck that God has somehow deserted us left us in this dark place do we deserve this or not what does it mean how do I move through this darkness to find the life that I dream of and the life that I hope God gives to me 
That's just about the most difficult thing in the world, is figuring out on a continuing basis the meaning of what is taking place in our lives, the blessings and the dark times, good times and bad times. And surely that is what Mary was thinking of in these moments. How can this be? What does this mean? That I will be the mother of a child called the Son of God. This is just what Luke tells us. This is what Luke tells us. Somehow she moved from how can it be to let it be. In one short paragraph, all of these things going through this young girl's mind, in one short paragraph, she concludes by saying, let it be with me as God wants it to be. There is no greater picture of faithfulness in either the Old or New Testament than this picture. When Mary, a 13 or 14 year old adolescent says, in the midst of such utter crisis, she goes from, how can this be? To let it be with me, as you have said. The Roman Catholics got it right. The Roman Catholics got it right when they elevated Mary, blessed virgin, mother of God, the one who shows us what it means to be faithful to God. What would it mean for you and me in the season of Advent or maybe in the new year to find ourselves in a moment where something is happening in our lives that's just bewildering or joyful or fearful and to somehow think that maybe God has come to us and made us pregnant with the possibilities of a God-given life. What would it mean in that moment to utter these words? Let it be.